Well, it is indeed very nice to be here. Nice to be in St. Petersburg and EU. I was actually talking, I think, in this room in 2007, and the topic um, was Marxism after communism. And your rector, who was then not rector, Ole Kordin, said, Michael, Michael, he also, we also, like Velko, I knew Ole in Berkeley, we have many uh, contested discussions, and he said, uh, Michael, you got the wrong title, it's not Marxism after communism, it's communism after Marxism. Yes. That's an interesting inversion. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about Marxism after Polanyi, and it is indeed a question whether it should be Polanyi after Marxism. I think Polanyi himself would say um, he's after Marxism. And I'm going to make an argument that uh, actually Marxism itself will benefit from a dose of Polanyism. Um, I'm not used to sitting down, but I'll try and sit down um, just to not to establish any hierarchy here. Um, though having the microphone obviously gives me a privileged position. Um, let me say this. Where did I come across this fellow Polanyi? Well, I, many of us read Polanyi um, when we were graduate students. Um, but actually, I became a devoted Polanyi fanatic in Siktivka, Komi. Now, some of you even may know where Siktivka is. In the old days, nobody knew where Siktivka was in St. Petersburg. Whoa, that's in the provinces. But actually, all sorts of good sociology came from Siktivka, right, Sveta? Right. <laughs> Um, so I was there in the 90s, and I had, been spent, I had spent time about a decade on and off working in factories in Hungary. Factories that work, by the way, let me tell you, socialist factories that work very well. Very well indeed. And I was very impressed with socialist factories in Hungary. Unfortunately, not everybody was, and uh, they disintegrated um, with the collapse of state socialism, I call it, and I was in Hungary, in factories, and by the way, it's very interesting. I used to visit the Soviet Union beginning in the middle 1980s, before many of you were born, and uh, I would tell sociologists in Moscow that I am a sociologist and I do my sociology by working in factories. They looked at me in disgust. How can that be serious? That is not science. And they said to me that there's only one person who does anything similar, and that is Alexeyev, and who was actually here sitting there, and it's the first time in my life that I have actually met him, and I was told about him for the last 30, 40 years. I mean, 85 is 30 years. And so it was a great honor to meet him. And um, so this was already a great event for me. Um, because he was actually working in factories, writing a diary. He was dissident. And one of the part of his sort of, uh, ex he was exiled in a sense to factories. And he was the one participant observer in Soviet Union who did sort of work similar to mine. And he has written these four volumes of his diaries, and uh, they are, Eliane has got them there. Um, anyway, so let me, that was just, that, I'm sorry, that was just a, uh, an aside. But let me tell you, all right, so I come to Russia because, so Hungary is, is moving from state socialism to capitalism. I said, I am not interested in that transition. I was interested in this transition from state socialism to democratic socialism. I come to the Soviet Union, and you know, within months, Within months, everywhere crisis befalls me, when I was in Zambia, was in Chicago, was in Hungary, it usually took a year or two before the country sort of subsided under pressure of my participant observation. But it was only a few months before the Soviet <laughs> Union collapsed. And uh, 
So my friend said to me, you, Michael, are responsible everywhere you go for crises, and you are not leaving Russia again. You're not going to Cuba, to Chile, to China. You are going to stay there. We're going to put you in a labor camp up there in Comey, in Siktivka, and you are going to stay there for the rest of your research existence. And so that is what I did for 10 years with the help of Sveta and other sociologists up there in Siktivka and in Vokuta, I was following the demise of the post-Soviet Russia, a process I call involution. I had great difficulty understanding what was going on. The places that I had always studied were factories, but factories were disappearing closing down, their assets being stripped. And how can a Marxist, whose analysis was always based on the point of production, make sense of what was going on in post-Soviet Russia, and Siktivka in particular? The place that I had usually found uh, as my sort of base was factories. They were no longer there. Well, actually, factories were there. Workers were going to the factories, but they were not getting paid. And they were so committed to those factories that hoping that somehow, somehow, some pay would be made. Perhaps they'll get a few bottles of vodka, at least. Um, but in the end, they closed down. So I had to think, rethink my Marxism. And what seemed to be going on in... Comey, was a process of radical marketization, pseudo-marketization, in which the realm of exchange was dominating the realm of production. What was really dynamic in Comey was the realm of exchange, dominated on the one hand by the mafia and on the other hand by the banks, and of course they were not so unrelated. And it was the rise of, you might say, a sort of uh, finance capital with Russian specificity. Um, and how was I to grasp this phenomenon of marketization that was actually destroying the post-Soviet Russian economy? And it was at this point that I turned to Karl Polanyi, and I actually became a devotee of Karl Polanyi, and I have ever been so since. And why? Because Karl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, which everybody in this room should read, if you remember anything, remember that. Um, and it is in Russian, I believe, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it is a book that really attempts to come to terms with the power, destructive power of markets. And so, I'm going to give a talk today in the next, what, how much time, where's my boss? Uh -huh. 40, 40 minutes. 40 45 minutes and I've had 10. However long you need. No, 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 no. no. That's a bad idea. Uh -huh. um, I, all right. Well, another 30, 35 minutes. I want to just run through how I think, how I think the ideas of Polanyi can help uh, to develop a Marxism for today. So, all right. Let me start with my basic thesis number one, Marxism. Now, there's obviously, I don't give up talking about Marxism in Russia. I'm, I feel it's my mission I should do so, even if I am going to address a very skeptical audience. Um, for me, Marxism is a live tradition that constructs itself and reconstructs itself historically and geographically. Let me tell you how I see this Marxist tradition. There are foundations. The foundations are in the writings of Marx and Engels. I have four roots, four foundations, the early writings, the manuscripts, the Paris manuscripts, on alienation. Does anybody read Marx these days? Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, that sounded good. Okay. The 
Paris manuscripts, the German ideology, the four premises of all history, the thesis on Feuerbach, all about the relationship of theory and practice, and the preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy where Marx summarizes his theory as he sees it, the theory of historical materialism. It's about two pages long. Those are my foundations, and they are the foundations of a tree. Three volumes of Capital. The trunk of the tree with the roots as I have just spelled them out. The three volumes of Capital is the theory of capitalism. Those little branches down there are Marx's political writings, 18th Brumaire, class struggles in France and civil war in France. Great writings, but not very theoretical in my view. Ah. And then what comes after Marx comes Marxism. Marx always said he was not a Marxist. Well, okay, too bad. But there was a lot of interesting stuff that comes afterwards. German Marxism, 1890 to 1920. It's responding to the specific conditions of Germany in which the economic crisis that Marx anticipated was not really appearing in the way that he anticipated, in which the working class, for the most part, was not actually becoming revolutionary, but becoming increasingly reformist under the direction of the Social Democratic Party and the trade union. German Marxism, the figures there, the debates there of Kautsky, Bernstein, and Luxembourg. The problem for these German Marxists was when will the final crisis of Marx, of no, Marxism, right? When will the final crisis of capitalism come? That was the big debate. This was the golden age of socialism and Marxism, yes. And then look what we have Russian Marxism, Bukharin, Trotsky, Lenin, and then that degenerates, it's called a degenerate branch called Soviet Marxism. Responding to the particular conditions of the Soviet Union, just as Russian Marxism responded to specific conditions of Russia, 90% of the population being peasant. This was not supposed to be the place where revolution takes place. So out of that, you get a Western Marxism, which is in a sense still building on the traditions of Marx and Engels and of prior Marxisms, but in antagonism, opposition to Russian Marxism, but particularly Soviet Marxism, and driven by the question, why revolution in Russia in the East and why not revolution in the West and advanced capitalism? And in Western Marxism, we have the Frankfurt School, we have Gramsci, we have Lukács, and we have these French Marxists, you might say, people like Althusser. Yes, and then we have third world Marxism. Again, responding to the previous forms of Marxism, but the specific conditions in the global south, as we call it today. We may identify the third world Marxism with the specificity of the conditions in China, Maoism. My favorite, however, is Fanon. I've been spent a lot of time in Africa, and Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, to my mind, is the critical, important, central text of third world Marxism, bringing together issues of class and race and colonialism. And so, today, what is the Marxism of today? What I'm showing you is a tree that is ever growing. As long as there is capitalism, there's going to be Marxism, <laughs> like it or not. The question is, what is the Marxism of today? That is what this talk is about. Well, some people say, and this is very important, that we must forget about what happened in this part of the world, Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. That's nothing to do with Marxism. That's about Marxist ideology, and that was all statism. So they, my friends, my friend like Eric Wright, is always said, oh, it doesn't affect us. My view is very different. We have to build into our understanding of the history of Marxism, the history of the Soviet Union. There's no way out. This is a reality. This was a genuine attempt to actually build socialism. And actually, I had the very great privilege yesterday of going around uh, 
the old area around Beauty Love Works and to see the constructivist technology, uh, architecture of that area, and to, to have a sense of the incredible experimentation that took place in this country in the 1920s. This was a real, genuine attempt to build socialism. It has to come back. We have to engage with that reality. Still, what is the Marxism of today? Well, <coughs> yes, if I call it sociological Marxism. That's what I'm going to talk about. That's where I will end. But let me tell you how I get to this sociological Marxism. Today's context is neoliberalism. What is neoliberalism? It is everything to everybody, like public sociology. You know, it means different things to different people. Well, for me, neoliberalism, first, it involves state-sponsored marketization. State-sponsored marketization. It is not a laissez-faire story. It is a state-sponsored marketization, and marketization involves commodification, and that is in fact making things into commodities that are exchangeable, to make something into a commodity, to make my body, my kidney into a commodity means it has to be extricated from my body. It involves what? Dispossession. Dispossession. I wonder if this is the right PowerPoint. Doesn't matter. Okay, this was, I want, all right. So dispossession is part and parcel of commodification, uh, sometimes known as privatization. Dispossession um, is often a violent process, dispossessing of people of access to land, dispossessing people of access to um, their labor power, and so forth. And the third feature of today's neoliberalism is that actually this process of marketization excludes increasing numbers of people in the world on the one hand, and for those who are included, who actually gain access to the market and employment, are unequally, increasingly unequally included. That is how I understand neoliberalism. So... From Marx to marketization. How does Marx talk about marketization, commodification? I don't know, volume one? Remember the opening pages of volume one? Velko's smiling. He's been well taught at Berkeley. Okay. Hmm? That's the very last part of volume one. I'm talking about the opening pages of volume one. Yo, know, this is this. You're gonna. You're in deep trouble if you can't tell me what the opening pages of Volume One are about. This is terrible. <laughs> the be- value. Pro, of you know, no. Velcro. Yeah. You know, you, you, this are your 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 the represent. Value. Use value. Ah! <laughs> Come on, you saved. You saved the European University. Well done. Okay, yes, commodity fetishism. There is a simple idea, but brilliant idea, that actually the realm of exchange conceals the realm of production. This pullover is what I buy. But if you look actually in the back here, you'll see, well, it's made in actually Uruguay. And you get a sense that this thing was actually produced. But when we buy and sell things, we don't think of production. Markets conceal production. That's right, volume one. Volume two, markets organize the relationships among enterprises. Volume two, I not many people read volume two, it's very boring. And volume three, well that was written by Engels, but anyway, in volume three, therefore very accessible, volume three is all about the way markets organize competition among capitalists that lead to the falling rate of profit and to the deepening of crisis of capitalism. At no place in this three, three volumes is the experience of marketization itself taken seriously. We need to treat the market as an experience in its own right. Okay, enter Polanyi. Polanyi 
In the book, The Great Transformation, written in 1944, um, which is an amazing historical account of capitalism from the perspective of the market, talks about the possibility of markets, and the possibility of markets lie in political conditions and social conditions. They do not spontaneously appear. There is no market road to market capitalism. You know, the Russian transition, you know, the 500-day Shatalin plan, we'll go in 500 days from state socialism to capitalism, the Soviet road, you might say, the Bolshevik road from state socialism to capitalism, overnight revolutionary. That, Polanyi would not say, would say is not possible, that you need to have to build institutions, the Chinese understood it, you actually saw it in, you built Capitalism under the frame and umbrella of the state. Not here in Russia, but the conditions of possibilities of markets lie on the state and in certain social conditions, Polanyi argues. But he also argues a historical account, mainly based in Britain, that starts at the end of the 18th century, and it is an ascendancy of the market through the 19th century into the 1930s, when there is a counter-movement was represented by fascism, which is of great concern to him, of Stalinism, because the 1920s in the Soviet Union really did engage and develop the market, but Stalinism, in a sense, collectivization and five-year plans was a reaction against the market, as well as social democracy and the New Deal in the United States. This is the counter-movement to the overextension of the market, and Polanyi said that it is that reaction that is as significant as the expansion of the market. The reaction can be the very authoritarian or dictatorial regimes and the limitation of freedom. Yeah. So, that is his book, in a nutshell, written in 1944 when he was trying to come to terms with what had happened in the Second World War and what had generated it. And this is his story, that basically on the left we have the rise of the market and then on the right the reaction to it, marketization and its counter-movement. Well, Polanyi said, humanity would never be so crazy as to ever again experiment with market fundamentalism. And he was not right. He was wrong. We saw in the 1970s, following a period of social democracy and Keynesianism, of state socialism, we saw the emergence of a new wave of marketization that many now call neoliberalism, supposedly starting in Britain and the United States um, around the middle 1970s. And that actually creates problems for Polanyi. He did not anticipate new waves. And once you recognize there's a second wave, a wave in the 1970s, then you have to begin to rethink his entire historical account. And perhaps there was not just one long wave that ended in the 1930s, but there were multiple waves. And I would suggest there are in all, in Polanyi's account, three waves of marketization. And there's my beautiful picture, and why I needed my PowerPoint. So what you see is, in the first wave, this is Britain, but he was also referring to Europe, and it's an interesting question to what extent his account can actually apply to uh, other countries outside North America and Europe, and I've tried to think about it in the context of South Africa, but I can't talk about that here today. But anyway, a first wave, starting in 1795, with the sort of regulated labor market associated with Spienhamland, we get this ascendancy of the market, and then we get this moment in 1834 where we have an unregulated market, and then the reaction begins. 1848, Chartist movement, factory movement, cooperative movement, and then in 1873, 1886, 
is the Great Depression and then World War I. I'm suggesting that this period was a period of counter-movement and then a new wave of marketization starts in World War I and is abruptly ended in the 1930s with counter-movements in the countries I've just described, many of those movements leading to a more a regime that restricts freedom. And then we come to 1973, um, and that is the beginning of a new wave of marketization, sometimes associated with that economic crisis of the oil. And then we see the ascendancy, 1989, well, the end of the Eastern Europe and then 91 of the Soviet Union was an intensification of marketization. In a sense, the Soviet Union at that moment, or Russia, was a sort of representation of the impossibility of anything being viable other than the market. 2008, some of us thought in the United States with the crisis of 2008 and Obama coming to power, oh, this must be the counter movement. I was among them. I thought this is like the New Deal. Not a chance. Crises are great for capitalism because capitalism reconstitutes itself ever more deeply and that is indeed what has happened post-2008. And the question is, will there ever be a turnaround from this wave of marketization? Question. Well, that crisis at the top there, in my view, is, whoa, I knew, all right, doesn't matter. Um, that crisis up there is the crisis of nature. That is my view, that we are heading slowly but surely to an environmental ecological catastrophe. I am not the only one who thinks this. And global warming is a really serious business that will, in a very uneven way, begin to vanquish populations on this earth. So the question is, how can we understand these three waves? And I suggest there is an idea in Polanyi that um, allows us to do so. One of the great virtues of Polanyi is not only that he's able to talk about these waves, this wave of marketization and the reaction, not able to only to talk about it in the global context in which it takes place, but he is also able to talk about the experience of marketization on the ground, and it is this idea of the fictitious commodity that is at the source of uh, that experience. What is a fictitious commodity? Well, this is hotly debated, and Polanyi did not say a lot about it. It is a factor of production that is commodified in an unregulated way that should not be commodified. Polanyi says that land, labor, and money are entities that should not be commodified. That when commodified, in my terms, in an unregulated fashion, they lose their use value. When labor is subject to unregulated exchange, so that it is hired and fired at will, it very quickly, the wage falls below the cost of reproduction of labor power, and labor can no longer labor. And equally, Polanyi argues that land, and we could extend this to the air and to water, when they are subject to processes of commodification, they will no longer be able to support human existence on this planet. And when you commodify money, when you make ex different currencies, so in a sense, uh, exchangeable in an unregulated manner, or you generate in this world all sorts of new currencies, new forms of money, new forms of debt, then you generate financial crises, you generate such uncertainty that capitalism cannot survive. And I suggest to you there is a fourth fictitious commodity that Polanyi did not talk about, that we have to talk about today, particularly when we are in this university. It is the commodification of knowledge. Thank you very much. Knowledge. And that what we are facing today in universities around the world is indeed the commodification of the production and dissemination of knowledge. And this could be the subject of a seminar unto itself. Um, 
I have talked about it over at the other university on the other side. Um, um, uh, but anyway, I want to include that here, labor, land, money, and the fourth factor of production is knowledge. Yes, okay. Right. And I suggest that each wave of marketization involves the articulation of fictitious commodities. And um, so we can think, therefore, not in terms of the articulation of modes of production, the old Marxian language, but now in terms of the articulation of the commodification of nature, labor, money, and knowledge. And at different periods of history, oh, shoot, we do have the wrong one, but it doesn't matter, okay. <laughs> That's the trouble with PowerPoint. You are driven by the power. Um, all power and no point. Um, yes. <laughs> so the point is that I would argue that the first wave of marketization, the first wave of marketization um, is driven actually by the commodification of labor, 19th century. And that's why Marx was sort of right for the 19th century. But then I think the second wave of marketization was driven by the commodification of money, and the third wave within which we are now, and the question is whether there will be ever a counter movement, the third wave is driven by the commodification of nature. That is going to be the driving force. Though, in each of these periods, we must look at the ways in which that driving force articulates with the commodification of these other fictitious commodities. Right. So... The question is this, under what circumstances will there be what Polanyi calls a counter-movement? It's interesting, when you read Polanyi and he talks about the counter-movement, for example, in the 19th century of the working class movements, the factory movement, the cooperative movement, it's almost as if you push the market so far and there is a recoil reaction, automatic. Now, we sociologists know that social movements don't develop just as a sort of automatic reaction. We know that they have to have resources. And we know post-Polanyi that a fellow called Edward Thompson wrote a great book called The Making of the English Working Class. We know that that working class was constituted out of a cultural set of cultural traditions. So we cannot assume, as Polanyi tends to do, that counter-movements are in any way inevitable as a result of the overextension of the market. We are in a situation today, I believe, that marketization continues, and we find there are indeed social movements, and I would give a, could give a talk on this precise character in which many of the social movements since 2009, and Russia seems to be in a sort of exception to this, but nevertheless, many of the movements since 2009 have been in a reaction to marketization, shaped by state nonetheless, but reaction to marketization, but they have all been of a national character. And I believe that you cannot have a counter-movement to third-wave marketization that will be effective by movements at the national level. The movement would have to be of a global character. We can only deal with commodification today, finance, nature, labor. These are all organized globally and to, con to in a sense, respond to and regulate uh, those commodifications will require some sort of counter-movement at a global level. And what that looks like is not entirely clear. So we have to think about the scale of movements and what is the relationship between local, national, regional, and then global movements. Can they build upon one another? I say many of the social movements of today are of a national character. They are a sense, a response to second wave marketization, not third wave marketization. And one very crucial factor is this, that what is going on with third wave marketization is not that people are being commodified, not only that being commodified and more and more things are being commodified, but things are being ex-commodified. That what is happening is that, for example, labor 
is being expelled from the market. There's one thing worse than being commodified, and that is ex-commodified. So ex-commodification is indeed the turning of commodities into something that are not commodities, not having access to markets. And so not surprisingly, many movements are engaged in the struggle to actually be commodified. It's not just against commodification. There is a real appeal of the idea of the market. People want to partake in the market because that is the sole source of livelihood. Okay, but yes, there are these movements, and we could talk about them, and we could talk about the specificity of the Russian context, though I wouldn't dare tread in that area. Um, but the point is that these social movements, as I believe, are sort of inspired by commodification and ex-commodification, are organized at the state level. And here we have a real problem with Polanyi. Because for Polanyi, state equals society. He did not differentiate it clearly between state and society. The market, in his view, expanded, and state responses and societal responses were almost converged with one another. We cannot stick with that perspective. It's another limitation of Polanyi, and therefore we have to go to... <laughs> <laughs> Gramsci. Okay. Okay. That's for you, Ilya. Okay. <laughs> State and civil society. Yes, so we have to recognize, just as Polanyi, interesting enough, was rather blind to the distinction between state and civil society, we could say that Gramsci was rather blind to the relationship between market and society. We need, in a sense, both. So we have to do a sort of under, have to understand the way these social movements get organized very differently in different national political regimes and how that makes it often very difficult for these social movements to transcend national boundaries. They are in a sense connected, they are networked, they influence one another, but ultimately are organized nationally. And I think we also have to be critical of the concept of civil society, and I follow the ideas, though not the details, of a fellow called Chatterjee, part of Chatterjee, an Indian political scientist, subaltern theorist, who argues that the idea of civil society is itself a sort of a northern idea. Perhaps there's civil society in the United States and Europe, but in most parts of the world, actually, civil society is very limited, it's fractured, and we have to think of something going on below the subaltern, a, what he calls, perhaps problematically, but anyway, what he calls political society. He's talking from the perspective of India. So when we're talking about the counter-movement and the organization of social movements, these are issues that we have to take into account. And I think that what happens is, as I've said before, that there is an unequal inclusion as well as an exclusion from the market. And so there are two sources of movements. And I think increasingly the movement that is most powerful are the movements around exclusion. It's almost as if Fanon's Wretched of the Earth is being written at a global level. For him, the wretched of the earth, the peasantry, the excluded, the marginalized, were the revolutionaries, were the participants in transformative action. And I think increasingly today, it is those who are excluded that indeed forge the greatest, uh, the greatest potentiality of social movements. Because those who are included are actually looking over their shoulders to those who are excluded, even though they are included in an ever more unequal fashion. Rafi, this is for you. You wanted me to talk about inequality, so I did. There, right. But the issue, the issue, the issue is, okay, we can talk about... Um, we can talk about the ways in which these three waves involve the articulation of these fictitious commodities. Um, we can talk about the potentiality of counter movements, but we can really only do the latter if we also have an understanding of what is driving markets 
And that is not in Polanyi. If you read Polanyi carefully, he sometimes just takes the rise of the market as given, but at other times it seems to come out of the heads of the political economists of the early 19th century. There is no theory of where the markets come from. Polanyi, in many ways, is anti-Marxist. Not anti-Marx, but anti-Marxist. He doesn't like theories of capitalism that somehow have a teleology. He doesn't like theories of accumulation that have a teleology. He doesn't like theories of class struggle that have a teleology. So he throws the baby out with the bathwater, as we say in English, and he is not able to understand, I think, where markets come from. What is propelling them? We have to know if we are to, in a sense, have a counter movement. So what are we to do? Where do markets come from? Polanyi has an idealistic perspective, an argument made very convincingly by Beverly Silva and Giovanni Arrighi. And what we need, I'm afraid, is to go back to Marxism and a theory of accumulation. We need to have a theory of accumulation that understands the continual pressures under crisis for the emergence of markets. Whoops. Okay. And that theory of capitalist accumulation, I will go for theories of long waves. Uh, I am particularly used to like Mandel, Ernest Mandel's theory of the ways in which Capitalism generates moments of expansion, generates crises, and then there is a reaction. What, what, what Mandel argued is that there is a sort of inevitability. You see, the point is that capitalism doesn't generate crises, same time generate intensified class struggle, then whoop, bumps your uncle, you go to communism, that actually what happens is a series, is a series of cycles in which Yes, indeed, capitalism generates contradictions and perhaps some struggle occurs, but those contradictions, well, the question is whether they will be resolved or not. That they develop contradictions is not is given, but whether they will ever be, whether they will be solved is an open, contingent question. And I think that is what fits in with this Polanyish view of markets that we have, uh, the ascendancy of markets can be explained, but not actually the counter-movement. That's why we need to begin to think of a theory of capital accumulation. We have to return to many of the more orthodox Marxist understandings of accumulation. Yes. And last, sociological Marxism. Well, just as there are three waves, I'm very mechanical. They call me a mechanical Marxism, MM. You know, just as there are three waves of marketization, there are three waves of socialism. And in the first wave of marketization, the socialism associated with Marxist theory is utopian. You know, in that first wave, the Marxists said, Phew. and this is Marx and the German Marxists, well, Capitalism is bound to destroy itself. We have got a foolproof theory. And therefore, we don't need to worry about what socialism will be. The workers will make socialism. We intellectuals will not prescribe. <laughs> so they didn't talk about socialism. They just said, well, they just waved their hands. Utopian, very dangerous, because in can come Stalinism. This is socialism, you know, uh, anyway. Utopian. Second wave marketization. Well, this is the grounded. Second wave marketization gives rise to a vision of state socialism. Socialism on earth. Real existing socialism. And, well, we could discuss it. Um, it is an attempt to realize socialism on earth. It had a central planning organization. It's interesting, of course, that, you know, this was, you know, 1928, you know, I mean, I don't think historians suggest that this, this was, I mean, this was really novel, this idea of collectivization and five-year plans. I mean, you can't find it really in Marx. You can't find it in Lenin's writings, really. No. I mean, you know, look at state and revolution. It's not really there, the collectivization and five-year plans. This was a sort of original sort of experiment, justified in the name of Marxism. 
Um, but anyway, it was a collectivist project, and uh, we have to take it into account. We have to examine it very seriously. And I'm, I'm waiting for, I hope I don't die before it happens, but waiting for, you know, historians to reconstruct and re-understand the whole amazing experiment of those 70 years. And then, well, the third wave of marketization, the third wave of marketization, the first wave, in a sense, was economically driven. The second wave was state-driven, state social. The third wave was, therefore, societally driven. Market, state, society. What I call societal socialism, bringing back the social in socialism. It's basically the ideas of Gramsci and Polanyi. Polanyi was also a socialist, in quotes, was very interested ultimately in a future. He saw the future either as fascist or socialist. And the socialist moment was the idea of collective organization of civil society. It didn't preclude markets or states, but that was the leading force, was that collectivization of civil society, societal socialism. Three waves of marketism, first wave classical, then we have the Soviet Western and third world Marxism, um, and it's the Western Marxism, I said before, is a response to the Soviets and the third, this is all the period, the sort of the second wave marketization, and then we have, yes, sociologists, here we come, sociological Marxism, drawing on the ideas of Polanyi and Gramsci, as I say, um, what is so important here is the centrality of civil society and the idea um, of bringing back the social in socialism. Is that all? Oh, well, that's too, that's too complicated. All right. If you want, we, uh, I've spoken enough. That's where I'll end, on sociological Marxism. So what I am suggesting to you then is that Polanyi really draws our attention to the importance of markets and the experience of markets located in national and a global context. And that experience is crucial to reconstructing Marxism for today. We have to come to terms with the centrality of the expansion of markets. And that involves a theory of accumulation of capital, a theory of the dynamics of capitalism that actually understands how markets will develop as a result of the crises of capitalism. And it also involves reconceiving socialism, that we have to begin to think of alternatives to the market capitalism in which we live, because those Alternatives are being systematically obliterated from our imagination. And that leads one to talk about real utopias. And that is a conversation for a discussion or for another time. I'll end on that note. Thank you very much.